from fiction. Two, quell the myths. And three, extinguish the lies. Affordable housing is a daunting concept to understand and ultimately accept. It is the law. And remember, this is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. It is a town issue. And even though I'm a registered Democrat, tonight I stand before you as a committed resident. So please keep that in mind because we're all in this together. Everything you've heard before is going to be challenged by the experts and you'll see why we decided to take the course we did. Our first expert, Jeffrey Serenity, he is easily the guru of Mount Laurel. Mount Laurel legend. I mean, when you look up Mount Laurel litigation in any of the legal scholar magazines and things along those lines. It's his picture. Okay. Excuse me? He's not the public. He's not the public. He's not the public. How can he do it when he was speaking for 45 minutes? So, uh, for the public, uh, the, the experts and now lunch get to speak uh, without time limit. Thank you. And, and, and my view is the public also has a time. Mr. Serenian is a true innovator and champion in the specialty field. He was awarded the status of super lawyer in the field of land use with awards for ethics and service in this discipline. He's a published author who put the definitive treatise of Mount Laurel and the Fair Housing Act on the books in this state. Approximately 70 municipalities utilize his services because of his proven record of success. Experienced, competent, ethical, this master of affordable housing laws leads our team in this difficult issue. But anything further, I present to you, Jeff Serenio. <laughs> So this is what I've devoted my career to. I've uh, written two treatises on this. I represent municipalities all over the state. I've had the choice of representing developers or municipalities. I only represent municipalities. Um, and if it was up to me, the law would be very different than it is. But my job is not to tell you how I think the law should be. My job is to guide clients and make recommendations based upon the law as it is. And so that's what I've done here, and that's what I've done throughout the state. Um, I'm devoutly apolitical, and I don't contribute to anyone's campaign. I want to be, I want to be appreciated for my expertise. Yeah, sorry, could you please speak a little louder into my microphone? Yeah, <laughs> I, um, okay, I'll go. Why don't you let him go up to the podium? Yeah, why can't he use the podium? No. I don't want to do that. I don't Sorry 
what I'd like to do tonight is what, what, what I'd like to do tonight is I'd like to uh, give you a, a brief history of the Mount Laurel Doctrine so that you appreciate how all these decisions are made within a certain context. To people who live and breathe this every day, they don't need it, but to most people, this is something new, and it's important to understand the history of the doctrine, where we find ourselves. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to explain to you, I can give you a brief overview of the history of the doctrine. The second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to explain to you where Anglewood Cliff stands in that history, and then I'm going to briefly explain to you where we are in ongoing negotiations with Fair Share Housing Center and 800 Sylvan, and then I'm going to close with making certain recommendations. Can I just interrupt you for one second? Folks standing, there's about five chairs in the front row. Just come on up. You can sit down and be comfortable, and um, it's getting a little too crowded for um, uh, safety of the public. So just please come in, please. There's more chairs here. There's a couple down here. Uh, if there's a chair empty next to you, raise your hand so somebody sees you, please. Thank you. Come on up, folks. You can leave whenever you want. Why don't you sit down? You don't have to stay. Part one. A brief history of the Mount Laurel Doctrine. This whole doctrine started back in 1975 when the New Jersey Supreme Court announced that developing municipalities have a constitutional responsibility to create a realistic opportunity for their fair share of low and moderate income housing. And with that, but the, the Mount Laurel document was created. In the wake of that case in 1975 called Mount Laurel One, there's a lot of confusion. What's a developing municipality? What's a realistic opportunity? It was new, there was a lot of pushback, and eight years later, the Supreme Court revisited this case again in another landmark decision known as Mount Laurel II. In Mount Laurel II, the Supreme Court was angry. And they said, 1975, we announced this doctrine. We expected municipalities to uh, address it and to take it seriously. And nothing has happened. And they said, to quote the Supreme Court, we're going to put some steel on this doctrine. And they established laws that gave developers a great deal of leverage against municipalities. That case is known as Mount Laurel II. In Mount Laurel II, the Supreme Court said that this doctrine applies not only to developing municipalities, but even to develop municipalities like Anglewood Cliffs. And it imposed a constitutional obligation on these municipalities to address this affordable housing <coughs> issue. Um, in Mount Laurel II, there are two main principles that you need to understand. In Mount Laurel II, they created the Builder's Remedy. And what the Builder's Remedy was all about, it was the Supreme Court's incentive to developers to sue municipalities to make them create affordable housing. And then the other important takeaway from Mount Laurel II is the judgment of repose. And the judgment of repose was the incentive that the Supreme Court gave to municipalities. Basically what the Supreme Court was saying, if you comply with these laws, if you develop a plan to comply with these laws, I will give you protection from Mount Laurel lawsuits for a period of six years. That has subsequently become 10 years, but it was six years back in, in 1983. In the wake of 1983, Three judges were appointed to oversee this litigation. One of the judges was Judge Serpentelli. He decided the AMG decision in 1984. And what the AMG decision did was it established a fair share formula by which every municipality could create its, it could identify its quote fair share and then try to figure out a way to how to, how to satisfy it. The, the formula, and the case was extremely controversial. It, it created two, uh, it sort of two balls rolling, if you will. One ball was it created a movement for a constitutional amendment. And there was, a, we came very close back in that time to the New Jersey, to, to a constitutional <coughs> amendment that would have eliminated the doctrine. But the other thing that it did 
was it created a movement for a legislative alternative. And that legislative alternative was signed into law in 1985 under the Kane administration. And that piece of legislation has come to be known as the Fair Housing Act, and I'm sure many of you have heard of the New Jersey Council on Affordable Housing, or COA, which is the agency that this legislation created. What the Fair Housing Act did was it said, municipalities, if you want to comply, we're going to create an opportunity for you to comply voluntarily so you're not subject to developers suing you and seeking builder's remedy. The, the uh, Fair Housing Act conferred primary uh, jurisdiction on COA and gave COA a tremendous amount of power to establish the laws of the state. And in fact, the court said that that's now the lead agency and the court should take a back seat and COA should take a front seat. Um, and just as the uh, Supreme Court had created the judgment of repose to reward municipalities that complied, any municipality that got a judgment of repose was immune from malleable lawsuits for six years. The Fair Housing Act created a similar thing, a grant of substantive certification, and those municipalities were protected for a period of six years. That six years period of protection has subsequently become 10 years. But what that meant was that the Fair Housing required COA to come up with new rules because since your, the period of protection was limited, that meant that they had to come up with rules for each housing cycle because it was COA's job that at any point in time, if any municipality wanted to comply voluntarily, there was a body of law with which it could comply. That legislation was vigorously challenged, and in 1986, the Supreme Court decided the Mount Laurel III decision, where the court said, we're happy that, that the uh, legislature came into the picture, we're happy that they enacted the Fair Housing Act, we're going to defer to the, to the legislature, we're going to defer to this agency that the legislature created, COA, and it's not time for the courts to take a back seat and, and for COA to take the lead. After that point, COA adopted regulations periodically. It adopted regulations for what we call round one in 1986. It adopted regulations for round two in 1994. It adopted regulations for round three in 2004. Those regulations were invalidated. COA came back, adopted another set of regulations. They were invalidated and the court said, one last time, you need to adopt these regulations and if you don't do it, we're gonna to have to consider some very serious uh, alternatives. What ha ended up happening, happening was 2014 was the deadline that the Supreme Court set for COA to adopt regulations. They tied 3-3, they didn't adopt regulations. Supreme Court threw his hands up in the air in a case known as Mount Little 4 in 2015 and said, it's now time to move the implementation of the doctrine back from this administrative body, COA, back to the courts. And it created a system whereby municipalities that were involved at COA could now sort a, 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 a lawsuit in court, a, a declaratory judgment lawsuit, bring themselves under the court's jurisdiction, seek immunity from lawsuits under the court's jurisdiction, and attempt to comply in that forum. Uh, the court came back again in Mount Laurel 5, a 2017 decision, and said that there was a period of time between the end of round two uh, in 1997 and the beginning of round three in 2015. They said we have to make up for that time, and they established certain laws of what municipalities would have to do to make up for all that time that was lost. So the history of the doctrine teaches us a few things. The law is here to stay. There's no indication on the horizon that there's going to be, uh, and there's been a lot of noise, but there's been no concrete uh, movements to change the law in the legislature. Um, and there's no legislative cure on the horizon. And more significantly, there's little hope of COA reconstituting because there's been over 300 municipalities that have complied in the, this declaratory judgment proceedings authorized by this uh, Mount Laurel Fort decision, 
and 280, over, almost 300 of them have settled their losses. So the impetus to make changes has diminished. Um, so that's all very significant. So the bottom line is, I could get up here and try to pull the wool over your eyes and say, trust me, the law is going to change in some significant way sometime soon. I don't see that happening. So we've got to deal with the law as, as is. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't try to change the law in the future, but you shouldn't assume that there's going to be a change if you know almost 300 municipalities have settled and the impetus for that change has largely uh, diminished. So the question now becomes, you know, where does Englewood Cliff stand against that backdrop? The, the, let, let me just finish this. And, Well, why, are you, why are you yelling out at the public? He's got to finish his presentation. Well, that will to the public after. And they'll answer your questions after. I, I promise to answer it. Just wait down if I forget, and I'll make sure I answer it, okay? Okay. So where's Englewood Cliffs in, in this history? Um, Englewood Cliffs filed a plan in round two. Remember, we're now in round three. So they filed a plan in round two. And in round two, what COA said, the rules then were, every town gets a number, they could demonstrate they don't have enough land to satisfy the number, and they could adjust their number down. But the portion that got adjusted away, it was the term for it, it's called unmet need. In round two, COA said, you have to take actions to try to address the unmet need. So that was the backdrop. So Englewood Cliffs filed an affordable housing plan in 1995, and it sought approval of that plan. What happened is in 1997, in November of 97, COA said, okay, you can adjust your obligation from 219 down to four. You have to create a realistic opportunity for your, what they call realistic development potential of four. And the remaining 215, you have to adopt an ordinance to, uh, it was the Prentice Hall site at the time, and you have to adopt an ordinance at six units an acre with a 20% set aside. That's what you have to do to address the so-called unmet need, the 214 that, that, wasn't, uh, that wasn't addressed. And Englewood Cliffs did not adopt that overlay zone on the Prentice Hall site, and they were, uh, in, in essence, thrown out of color, and they were exposed to builders' remedy lawsuits. Now, they weren't sued at that time, but they were they were exposed, okay? And, um, and so what happened after that is um, they, they, they did adopt and file a plan in round three. Remember, this was in round two I'm talking about. So they filed a plan in round three, and Englewood Cliffs, along with over 300 other municipalities, found itself in Never Never Land because cover was not functioning. Goal wasn't processing the plans. They didn't have a valid body of regulations. So what ended up happening was when the uh, Mount Laurel Ford decision came along, and the Supreme Court said, you know, we know 300 plus municipalities. You can no longer get your plan approved at Cuba, but we're going to create this alternative jurisdiction for you to seek a, uh, seek approval of the plan. You can move over to this alternative jurisdiction. You can file a declaratory relief action in court, and you can ask the court to give you immunity while the court processes your application for approval of your plan. So, Angle Cliffs did that on uh, June 30th, 2015. In, in November of 2017, the attorney for uh, for Sylvan, I'll call them 800 Sylvan, I'll just refer to them as Sylvan. The attorneys for Sylvan wrote a letter to the town and they said, you know, we would like to uh, redevelop our land with 600 units. We'll make 20% of them affordable and we would uh, ask for you to rezone us. The town didn't uh, respond, didn't say yes or no, and they went ahead and they brought a motion to try to intervene in this case that, that Englewood Cliffs had initiated 
when they filed that declaratory judgment action in June of 2015. So, um, so at that point in time when they moved to intervene, the, the borough had immunity for Mount Laurel lawsuits. And that immunity lasted till, till the end of 2017. On December 28, 2017, right before it expired, Anglewood Cliffs made a motion to extend that immunity. Now, before the court could decide that motion, Sylvan filed the builder's remedy lawsuit. Uh, that's when I got a call and I was asked, can you help? And the town retained me and I uh, helped defend that lawsuit. I was successful in having that lawsuit dismissed and I was successful in fighting for Anglewood Cliff's right to determine its own destiny. And so, um, So uh, basically, uh, what ended up happening um, is Sylvan filed an appeal of the dismissal of its lawsuit. And so on one hand, we're fighting Sylvan in the higher courts, where they're telling the higher courts, Judge Tosco's at that time, now retired, shouldn't have dismissed my lawsuit, reversed that decision to dismiss my lawsuit, and on the other hand, we're in, in the trial court before Judge Farrington, who's processing the declaratory judgment action we brought in 2015, processing our application to seek approval of a plan. So what's happened in the, uh, in the trial court proceeding is um, the judge has issued well, first of all, what happened in the trial court proceeding is there was a period of time where the parties sat down and tried to resolve their differences. We were unable to achieve a resolution, and by the end of 2018, we were rapidly moving into a litigation mode. And Judge Farrington basically set us, established a set of very aggressive deadlines uh, and said, well, since you can't settle, let's, let's move forward and let's go ahead and litigate. We, we were, so, so we found ourselves uh, uh, racing headlong uh, into litigation, and Judge Farrington made uh, multiple rulings that were really problematic for the town. And um, it was quite clear that um, the prospects of a successful result in front of her were not high, to say the least. And so, you know, we were, we, we, we were moving forward and uh, a, a newly elected council was created and it was, well, is there a way to, to, to solve this without facing the risk of Sylvan, who at that time had filed a, you know, was, was seeking the right to do 600 units at one time and like over 800 at the other time. And so we were, we were up against this fight and, um, and the court was quite clearly unsympathetic. And so a, a, a series of negotiations began with, uh, with Sylvan and um, ultimately, a non-binding memorandum of understanding was entered in April. Now, I emphasize non-binding. And the idea was, let's see how much we can reduce the intensity of how intensely that site could be developed. And then, let's make sure we protect the public's right to input. And let's see if we can work out an agreement that we would then present publicly, and then we would have an opportunity to, to decide whether to approve that or to fight further. It was quite clear to all of us that were in the litigation mode that it was 
it was a very bleak path that we were looking in in court. And it was quite clear that in a court proceeding, we were not going to make out well. However, if we could litigate a favorable settlement, um, we had the opportunity to take control, to manage how that property is developed, and to insulate the town as best as possible. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of uh, how far apart we were, you know, we were in a case where we were saying that we had a number of 584, if you look at what the obligation was for the prior rounds and for round three, that number was 584. And we were saying that we only had enough land to address an adjusted number of 77, and we were in all-out war litigation with Sylvan and Fairshire Housing Center, where they were claiming that the number could be 200 or 300, you know, three times what we thought was appropriate. We knew that if, so, so um, it was a very uh, difficult, there was a lot of risk involved with going forward in litigation with the court that was not sympathetic to the town. And we entered this, this uh, negotiation to see what can we work out, understanding that ultimately, whatever we came up with, we have to stand before you with a final form of agreement, and your choice would be to settle or to litigate. All the professionals that looked at this, it was very clear. Settle, litigating this was not going to end well for Englewood Cliffs. Through settlement, we had a chance to manage the risk. Through litigation, it was not, it was not looking good at all. Um, and so we went down this path, and, uh, and we've tried to put together uh, a settlement that's still not final, which is why I have to be guarded, and you may have questions that I'll have to say I can't answer, because we're not settled yet, we're still litigating, and until, unless and until we're settled, uh, I have to be guarded. But while we're going down this path in front of the trial judge, who had set like a January 25th trial date, and then moved that because the parties were settling, we are we are also up on appeal. Sylvan has has challenged Judge Tosco's ruling to dismiss its lawsuit. So we're up on appeal. I expect that on August 1st, the appellate, and we've managed to get several extensions of briefing that appeal. I'm expecting to get an order on August 1st that says, you know, you got to get your brief in in so much time, and. If they are able to reverse Judge Tosco's decision to dismiss their builder's remedy suit, their leverage is going to go up and their demands are going to be much greater. So the bottom line to all this is um, we're trying to manage the risk that's facing the town. Um, one thing that bears emphasis is not one unit of affordable housing has been created in this town. When you're in a mountain or a lawsuit, that's not a good fact, okay? A lot of developing municipalities have found ways to produce affordable housing. Here we are pushing back. We don't have any affordable housing to show for it. So that's a real problem. Um, the other issue here is um, we're, we're, one of the problems in this case, one of the problems with our history, and I don't think we should be plagued by it, but our adversaries pointed out at every turn, is we were basically thrown out of color because COA said, I'm approving your plan, but you need to adopt an overlay on the Prentice Hall site, and they didn't do that. It's a problem, you know, it's a problem. Um, and the, ju the judge in her rulings in November in December of 2018, the judge was expressing her frustration that this case wasn't settling. Remember, the vast majority of these cases are settling. Anglewood Cliffs was fighting, and they didn't have any affordable housing to show. Okay, um, so it was very clear to us when we started negotiating uh, with with Sylvan that if this case gets tried. You, you cannot expect a good result. 
on 